Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a show for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to many friends as Mags. Well, hi, everyone. In today's world, we know that there are some tremendous opportunities for our local churches to reach out and minister to immigrants. Today, we're going to talk with Rick and Patty, who have loads of experience and lots of ideas on how to do this well. During the interview, you'll hear them refer to their seminar for churches. Some of that material, they have recently moved online into a webinar format. And I remembered that someone that I know, my wife Kathleen, has recently attended one of those webinars. So I thought it would be interesting just quickly to ask Kath before this interview for her quick review. So hi, Kath. Welcome to the program. Thanks, son. Why did you take this webinar? I was interested in taking the webinar called Using Zoom to Teach ESL Online because I'm involved with the outreach program at our church, reaching out to women who are new to the community, coming from other nations, who really want to improve their English skills. I felt this would be helpful in working out the kinks and learning how to do ESL online more effectively. So this particular webinar was especially about the tool. Did you also learn about the other parts of Rick and Patty's curricula? Mm -hmm. They made everything available to us. And it was very interesting to see the creative and varied means Mm -hmm. they use to reach out and love new Canadians. I got a lot of good ideas and really appreciated their help in particularly using the Zoom format for our ESL classes. So you have an overall positive impression? You'd yes. You'd recommend it to I others? would highly recommend it. Okay. Well, Rick and Patty didn't ask us to do this, but we thought it would be neat to get a real-life reference on this couple and on the ministry and the value that they are offering. Now let's go ahead with our conversation. Our guests today are Rick and Patty Love, who have worked with more than 280 churches and ministries to help develop pathways to Jesus for new immigrants. Patty has been the pastor of Intercultural Ministries at Foothills Alliance Church in Calgary, Alberta since 2006, and Rick became the director of Love New Canadians in 2014. Now, I want to mention this is not the first time that Rick and Patty have been on the Global Missions podcast. We need to go all the way back to season one to find them. Rick and Patty, it was episode number four, Ah. single digits, (laughs) which is great. This morning during my walk... I was able to re-listen to that episode, and I can personally say that it is a valuable episode, and it is worth considering going back to listen to this. We will include the link in the show notes. Rick and Patty, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so Our much. voices are five years older. <laughs> right. We could do a voice comparison just for interest and see if it sounds different. Right? That. Sure. Yeah. I just want to affirm that in that episode and what we talk about today, it's not limited to Canada, right? Yeah, we think it would work in any church context, actually. Do you have experience, just take us outside of Canada, have, have you had opportunity to engage with churches outside Canada? We've helped those teaching English for ministry purposes in 13 other countries, including the US, the UK, Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. Wonderful. Well, there may be listeners on the podcast who are in some of those places, but at least you hear that there is a breadth to the value of this that goes well beyond any immediate context. Rick and Patty, just give us a sketch again as we get to know you. There's some listeners maybe weren't here in the first season. How did you become passionate about ministry to immigrants? Ah, Well, Rick and I were in cross-cultural ministry in the Philippines for many years, 11 years. And at one point, we were back in Canada attending a, a seminar with our denomination and the district superintendent of our denomination in Alberta said, let's think of creative ways to reach more people around us here for the gospel. And I remember telling Rick, if God called us back to Canada, I would want to serve in a church, in a local church, 
reaching out to immigrants in the neighborhood around our building. And interestingly enough, that's what God called us to do two years later. I became pastor of Intercultural Ministries at Foothills Alliance Church, and it's it's been wonderful. The seeds were planted then some time before it came to maturity there. That's right. That's right. Well, Rick, you initiated a ministry called Love New Canadians, and we appreciate that's for Canada, but this would be Love New Arrivals to whatever country our listeners might be in. What led you to start this ministry? Well, as we started to see the ministry grow in our local church, and we started to see uh, spiritual fruit, we began thinking, what could we do to help other churches do something similar? And to be honest, we just didn't have enough faith to know how to make this happen. We saw all the obstacles. And then finally, in 2014, we just decided, okay, we, we don't see solutions for a lot of our questions, but we're just going to dive in and make this happen. So we started the ministry basically because we wanted to help churches ex- experiment with the same kind of model that we've used here in Calgary and see what other churches can do with that same model. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying before, too, that you will sometimes have uh, COVID days makes this a little bit different, perhaps, but you would actually have churches come and observe what you're doing at Foothills so that they could learn, right? Yes. One year I thought, oh, this is happening quite a bit. I kept track and we had over 50 people from other churches come to our church and see what we were doing and ask questions. And they were intrigued by this three-step approach to ministry to new Canadians that we were developing. Now, the three steps is some of what we're going to talk about today. Just before we get to the three steps Talk to us about the values that undergird what you're doing. What are the foundational pieces under the practical three steps? Yes. My volunteers and I, several years ago, were thinking about this. What are our values, our primary ones? And we decided on the values of being welcoming, respectful, and interactive. My volunteers and I realized that we're not running a language school. We're a group of friendly Canadians who are just helping our neighbors settle into Canada. And if they're interested, we want to share Jesus with them. So we try to make everything we do very welcoming. We don't have assessments and limited class sizes, and we don't charge money for our classes. We don't charge money at our church if neighborhood teenagers come into our programming or neighborhood children. So we didn't see why we would do that with immigrants for our classes. And we try to be really respectful, respectful of the faith that our neighbors have in their religions. And so we're really clear in our advertising how how we advertise a class. And if it has any spiritual content, we say that in the advertising at our settlement level of classes, we, we have very little spiritual content. And then we try to be really interactive. We got serious about that a few years ago and have changed the format of our classes primarily to a lead teacher starting the class, but then uh, partway through the class time, they break into small groups so that every student is in a small group with a kind Canadian as the volunteer lead of that group. And it's super interactive, lots of opportunity for people to talk. That's great. The three principles you've mentioned, and it resonates when you say, you know, we some of the things we're doing, we're offering services to help people arrive and settle in. You stick to that. It's not a secret door to the side to get into a spiritual Bible study, you know, a Bible study, but that you're very upfront and clear about what you will do. And you're not shy about the invitation to spiritual conversation. That's right. We're a church. Of course, we love Jesus. And if you're interested, we have classes. So we start with settlement programming, our stage one in our three-stage format. And at the settlement level, as I said, there's very little, if no, spiritual content. So we have lots of ESL classes, conversation classes, beginner, intermediate ESL for gardening, we tried this summer, ESL book studies. I think right now they just started a book study on the biography of Florence Nightingale. So lots of ESL classes at our settlement level. And then we do specialized classes to help people settle, preparing for the citizenship test, 
finding jobs in a Canadian context, which can be really different from their birth country employment context. And then, of course, we have parties, lots and lots of parties and banquets. During this COVID time, we've moved all our parties online, and that stretched our creativity a little bit. But we've done an online talent show. Oh, my goodness, so much fun and very intercultural. An online scavenger hunt, an online Canada party. Recently, we did an online pantry shower for a newlywed couple in our group. And anybody who wanted to dropped off pantry items to the front steps. And then we had an, a party online and the couple showed us their wedding photos. That was a lot of fun. What a great idea. Just well, leveraging the tools that we have. So this first stage is settlement. That's the the idea around there. And one of the key words that you've indicated in your notes too, is that this is a friendship level. You're building relationships, right? Real live friendships. Yeah. And that, that really works well with our small group format of most of the classes that we run. So our neighborhood immigrants are making friends with the volunteers because they can join as many classes as they want during the week that uh, appeal to them. And they're meeting friendly Canadian neighbors in all those classes. Yeah. Now, Patty, you've mentioned even in this stage one, the first stage that we're talking about, so many different topics from gardening to showers and and so on. Are you yourself an expert in all of these things? (laughs) You know, I'm not a gardener. I'm a house planter. So when we did the gardening session this summer. We did it as a trial run for four weeks and we had three amazing gardening guest speakers. And then I was the fourth and I focused on the house plants, but I learned so much about outdoor gardening during that session. Yeah. But with all those classes, it's like, we just keep asking, what can we do so we can meet immigrant neighbors that we haven't met before? And then Mm -hmm. we try to be creative about what kind of class could we offer so that we could connect with those people? Uh And what do our volunteers, what are they interested in? And how can we use their interests and their time and their kindness to reach immigrant neighbors? Yeah. Well, this is what I, I saw too. Of course, your focus is on sharing with and ministering to and helping those folks who are new to Canada. But it sounds to me like you'd be opening doors of different hobbies, interests, expertise in the church as well. Have you seen that, you know, as a a positive thing in the church? Yes. Yeah. Volunteers will come to me and say, I have an idea about home repairs. I like tinkering around my house, fixing things. Could I help any new Canadians with that? So we did an ESL for home repair course uh, one summer and had different guest speakers and we did at that time we did field trips to what's the Canadian store called yeah it's a good, <laughs> Canadian <laughs> tire that's it yeah right. yep. <laughs> that kind of international thing, yeah. workers got a Canadian tire <laughs> right. Home Depot Rona whatever it is yeah it gives us a good idea that you're just you're opening doors all over the place and uh, when you talk about the groups I wonder I'm not sure if you were going to mention this particularly along the way, but when you talk about those groups, how many people are in those groups? Well, say, for example, if we had a conversation class with 25 students and five volunteers, so the small groups would each have, what's my math, five students and a volunteer. And that's a little bit large. We like to have them smaller than that. We, we love having, you know, two students and a volunteer in every group, but it just depends on the number of students, the number of volunteers. Altogether right now, during these COVID days when all of our programming is online, we have about 150 students and about 50 volunteers in various ways. So we, you can see we, we try to keep our ratio pretty tight there in small groups. It's, it's been a little discouraging because since going online, we have less people that we're connecting with, but... There's many that we're connecting with on a very regular basis. Some Mm -hmm. are coming to three or four classes a week. Yeah, so we're getting to know them really well and deepening our friendships with people. And then they feel safe and they're sharing more from their hearts where they're at in life and on a faith journey. Well, these tools that we have, I'll just mention this too. Kath appreciated some of the training that you did just using the tool, in this case, Zoom. 
and how to equip your volunteers. One of the things you do is you equip your volunteers, right? That's right. Sure. What, what, what we did is uh, in the last six weeks, we've offered a webinar three times and we just we thought, well, what do people need to know before they have an online class? What do they need to know about Zoom during an online class? And then we just use various curriculum samples to show how you might use the curriculum sample, how you might use the curriculum in various kinds of ESL classes online. Because there's so many Zoom tools that a person can use, but so many churches we've connected with, they stopped doing their ESL classes when COVID started to hit. And they thought, well, I, I think they figured out, well, we need to do something. So they're with fear and trepidation, they're jumping in and Mm -hmm. we're just trying to encourage them to do that. And we've we've committed ourselves to helping any church-based ESL class that we can help with. Just let us know because we've made a lot of mistakes along Mm -hmm. the way Mm -hmm. and uh, we can help churches avoid some of those mistakes. Back Back when it first started, the COVID thing, we were very nervous about going online, but we knew we had to do it. And we knew that God wanted us to increase during this difficult time, not to decrease. I'm thinking of the the verses in Jeremiah. And the transition to online classes was nerve-wracking, and we made mistakes, but we're happy to share those mistakes with other churches and to encourage them to start. And I always think at the foundation, if you can just click a link and get on Zoom and see your students' faces, your neighbors' faces on Zoom. You have started your ministry online and and you learn all the other kinds of, what do you call it on Zoom? You know, all the like other the things. tools. Yeah, the, all the other Zoom tools. Annotation, as the weeks share. go by, yeah. yeah. Sure. So the first stage is settlement. Rick, what's the next stage that you want to mention here? So it's easiest to talk about the third stage. The third stage is the spiritual focus. So if the first stage is for people who are looking for help settling into a new country, they're looking for friendship, they want to learn English. The third stage is for those who have a spiritual interest. The people who come to these classes are maybe new believers or they're close to faith. They just have all sorts of questions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so like I've been teaching a ESL Bible study now every week for many, many years. And it's like, it's such a fun class to teach because people have great questions. We talk about the scripture, we, we pray together, and it's just incredibly encouraging for everyone. The challenge, of course, is, so if you come to like, say, a pronunci- ESL pronunciation class or a beginner class or a conversation class, how do you end up at the Bible study or Alpha or s- some of these other third stage courses? And what we found is that it's not an easy thing to happen. So what we did is we we came up with, well, it's not like we're terribly clever, but maybe <laughs> God gave us the grace to think of a transition step. And in your notes, that's coming up soon. Yeah. <laughs> what is that transition step? <laughs> we'll get to stage two in a minute. So we've got one, number one is settlement. Number three is the spiritual class. Just talk to us again about how churches have gone about that. Some of it's moved online. Are they typically taking material that they've used elsewhere in small groups and applying it? Yeah, at the spiritual stage, churches can use whatever resources they want to help people. We've written ESL Bible studies for for the third stage that fit well with our kind of our philosophy of spiritual teaching on this journey for new Canadians. It's it's very gentle, very interactive. We have Muslims and Buddhists and atheists, various religious backgrounds coming to our ESL Bible studies and to Alpha. Alpha is a huge tool at our church in our third stage of our pathway to Jesus. We we try to have a Bible study where the focus is on understanding the words of Jesus and then applying the teaching of Jesus to our life. And then in there, we we carefully go through each text. So we're going word by word because people are learning English. So we talk about what does temple mean and what is a disciple and what, whatever the lesson is for that week. And then we always have vocabulary lessons. So it's ESL and a focus on understanding the teaching of Jesus. Well, here are some ideas on the bookends, if you will. We'll get to stage two in a middle, minute, but stage one is settlement. 
ministry or settlement classes and events. Stage three is spiritual classes and events. In just a moment, we'll ask Rick and Patty to share the second step that goes in the middle. Just before we get to that part of the conversation, we'd like to share with you this missions resource that we hope will be helpful to you and your church. Empowered by Christ's heart of compassion, we share what we've been given and what we've experienced to change tomorrow by what we do today. We are you. We are business people, accountants, engineers, writers, IT specialists, videographers, mothers, agriculturalists, doctors, teachers, and social workers. Put your faith in action and walk with us as we bring life and hope to the peoples of Asia and the Arab world. Go to InnerServeCanada.org to learn more. And now, back to today's conversation. Okay, we're back with Rick and Patty who have rich experience helping churches in Canada and around the world create pathways to Christ for immigrants. So Rick and Patty, we've got step one, settlement classes and events. Step three, spiritual classes for those with spiritual interest. Rick, we can't wait. What goes in the middle? (laughs) So the challenge, of course, is how do we find students who want to move further in that pathway? And What we found is that we had much more success when we started figuring out a stage two, which is for us a transition step. And what what we tried to do is make it the most gentle introduction to the gospel that we could create. We wanted people to come and whatever their spiritual background and to feel comfortable talking about a biblical text. So what we do is each week we read together, students read together a gospel text. So recently we did one on Luke chapter one, where the angel appears to Zachariah and tells him Elizabeth will have a son who will be named John. So we read that text and then we do a summary, a little simpler English. The lesson is geared for intermediate level students. We also do uh, at the same time another class for beginner students. So we, we tried to make it so it works no matter what the English level is. And then once we read the text and the summary, we divide into small groups. So when we're in the church building, we need tables, doing online, we just go into Zoom breakout rooms, and we do vocabulary based on the lesson we just read, whatever the gospel text is. And it's a legitimate ESL class. So we start with recognition, we move towards production, it feels like you're in an English class. And then in the same small groups, what we do is discussion questions. So if in a typical Bible study, the goal is to understand the text and apply it to our lives, which is a great goal. Here we use the gospel text with the goal of having immigrants talk about their birth country, their families, their immigrant experience. We want them to talk about their successes, their dreams, their hopes. And as we get to know them better, their frustrations and their failures. So for example, Zachariah was startled when the angel appeared. So we'll ask a question like, when have you been surprised? Or when have you been scared? The angel talks about children and talks about disobedience. So we'll ask a question like, in what ways did you disobey your parents? So we like to ask questions that are an invitation to vulnerability. Because we found when we're open and and when others accept that invitation, our friendship grows much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Zachariah and Elizabeth were both old. So we asked the question, in your opinion, what's a good age to have children? Or the angel brought good news to Zachariah. What good news did you get last week? Or what good news would you like to hear next week? So it's really just having the participants just talk about their life and what's going on in in their minds. We try to have one spiritual, gentle spiritual question each week. So this this week, what we did was, Elizabeth says, the Lord has done this for me. And so we asked the question, what is something that God has done for you? So it's an invitation to talk about spiritual matters. And I've asked those questions before. And the people in my group, it's like the tumbleweeds are rolling across the prairie. Crickets. Crickets in the background. (laughs) Yeah, and it's great because they don't know what to do with a question like that. Because the people who come to this class are often from countries where they couldn't even ask questions about Jesus or the gospel or the church. And they don't come because they're interested in following Jesus, but they're genuinely curious. So if stage one is friendship and stage two is spiritual focus, I think of stage... Stage three is a spiritual focus. Stage two is about spiritual curiosity. And so what happens is students come and say they're learning English, they're making friends, 
they're getting to talk. They're, so they're, they're being accepted and they're loved. Yeah, and they, they find, belong. yeah, they belong. They belong. Class, yeah. So they think, hey, that was a good experience. I'm going to come back next week. And sometimes they'll bring a friend. And if they do that week after week, some comes month after month, and then someday they'll say things like, I'm not a Christian, but if I was a Christian, I would. Or, and then they'll, say, they'll start using God language or prayer language. And we've seen many atheists come to faith in this pre-evangelism class. And then you were just so thankful to God for the spiritual fruit because God's word is just so powerful. When people read about Jesus' life every week, Jesus is so incredibly winsome, people are drawn to him. So that's the focus in this stage two class is just to help people with their spiritual curiosity and invite them to take another step towards Jesus. So this second stage, you've entitled the Bridges class for the spiritually curious. I really appreciated the way you said we are very gentle, but I also hear that you're being very intentional. And those two qualities brought together make it very, very attractive, I think. Nobody is surprised, right? They understand that they're coming to something that will have a spiritual element at this point, unlike stage one, which may not have had any. In the Bridges class, we study Canadian culture for the first 10 minutes. What is Thanksgiving? What is Remembrance Day? And then we study English language, and we study the words of Jesus, or the life of Jesus. So that's how we advertise. And and we're so clever calling it Bridges (laughs) Bridges class, bridging the uh, settlement with the spiritual step. Fits beautifully. I'd like to ask a practical question. Others may have this too, but uh, I'm wondering, how do you make that step? How do you advertise this practically? If you have these settlement classes at stage one and they're coming to learn about house plants with Patty, yeah. <laughs> how then do you make the invitation to go to a Bridges class? Well, in our settlement classes, we advertise all our other programming in the settlement class. So say if we had 10 people in settlement, we'll advertise, oh, we also have citizenship test preparation. We have a party coming up. We also have another class called Bridges. And in that class, we study Canadian culture, English language, and the life of Jesus. You're welcome to come. So we do most of our Bridges class promotion in our settlement classes. So the more people we have who join in a settlement class or event, say if we had 10 people at a settlement level, we found that about half of them will come on to Bridges and then half of those will continue on to a Bible study. So say it's 10, 5, 2, yeah. Well, it's interesting. We should add that that may vary depending on the community, the background of these folks. Uh, You're in a fairly large metropolitan area. But that's encouraging to hear that there is significant participation in the next stage that you've designed intentionally that way. We tell students, no, no, you don't have to come to Bridges or to a Bible study. We're just happy to meet our neighbors and to help you settle. And what we found is that even years later, people will come back and start attending the Bridges class or starting attending a Bible study because maybe something happened in their life a crisis of some sort. And they remembered I was welcome there and people cared about me and I felt safe. Well, that is a beautiful testimony when people return for those types of qualities that the experience that they had there was loving. It was caring, Mm non-judgmental. Wow. What a beautiful thing to see that returning there. I wonder, we've got these three stages, settlement, bridges, and spiritual It's a great framework. I wonder if you could just share with us a story or two where you have seen a life impacted, some some transition and some blessing coming through this. Sure, yeah. I remember a woman named Karen who came from China, and she heard about our ESL classes, and she started attending them. She started attending the parties at our settlement level. She started attending how to find a job in Canada, those kind of things. And then, of course, we advertised the Bridges class. She started coming to Bridges, no spiritual interest. She just 
it was another ESL class to her and she was continued to learn English. And then she heard us advertising Alpha at our spiritual level in the pathway. And so she attended Alpha and she said, oh, I, I don't really care about learning about Jesus, but can I go to learn English? We're like, sure. Yeah, anybody's welcome at Alpha. So she, she went to Alpha for one semester, for a second semester, for a third semester. And that's when she responded to the Holy Spirit and gave her life to Christ. Meanwhile, well, during her third semester of Alpha, she would call her teenage daughter back in China every week to share with her what she was learning about Jesus. And on the week that she shared with her daughter about the Holy Spirit, her teenage daughter in China said, "Ah, it makes sense now. God would live inside me and help me follow Jesus. And so her teenage daughter gave her life to Christ over the phone and eventually was also able to immigrate to Canada where we baptized her and discipled her. So Karen's friend, Mary, moved to Canada. And Karen said, you got to go to this church. You move to Calgary and go to this church. They'll help you settle. And Mary came and was already a believer from China. But her adult daughter in China was not a believer. She came to visit her mom and her mom was sharing Jesus with her. And the adult daughter said, I don't know any young people who follow Jesus, everyone I know is old. Well, in our programming, she met young, vibrant Chinese followers of Jesus and was shocked. And by the end of the summer had asked if she could follow Jesus too and get baptized and is now growing in her faith. So it's just amazing how God uses simple classes, simple parties to help people. And the Alpha class is reaching people around the world, even though it's being taught in our location. That's fairly encouraging. Well, praise the Lord. What a wonderful testimony. I just, it struck me that fellow immigrants are sharing with each other saying, move to this city, like choose this city out of all the places they could settle because it's a church that will help you. Yeah. What a beautiful statement that is. We have new Canadians who have to move with their job and they go, can you tell me what church in that city has a Bridges class? I want to keep going. <laughs> well, what a wonderful idea. Let me just ask about this network. Is there any, is there any kind of intentionality linking this through? You're, you're generously available. I see that. Is it linked up anyway? Well, we talked to lots of churches and find out, like, as we've connected with churches, we're finding out more and more churches who have intentionally having a ministry with immigrants in different cities. Mm -hmm. And so one of our goals has been just to find out what they're doing, how they're doing it, when they're doing it. And as we can, we try to connect churches to talk about how we can learn from each other. Because so many churches are trying this in very different ways Mm -hmm. with different Mm -hmm. kinds of success. Well, I think it's tremendous. And I hope this is an encouragement to our listeners too. As I work in a a mission that travels to many churches, my work takes me to many churches and many denominations of churches, but rarely do I hear them interacting with each other. They will have good ideas independently of each other, but here's an opportunity to come together and learn from each other. So, What I've found is it's really common for churches in a community, in a city. So we know, I can think of four cities right away where churches gather on a regular basis, somebody takes the initiative and says, yeah, we want to do something. We're connecting with immigrants in our neighborhoods. So they get together and maybe they'll plan something once a year, three times a year. It just depends on the community. It really takes somebody to stand up and say, I want to bring those people together. Otherwise, it just is not going to happen. Yeah. Well, there's an invitation to be a catalyst then, right? Let's just talk a little bit about resources before we conclude. If our listeners would like to learn more about this What are the resources that you would recommend to them? We regularly have churches contact us to ask about beginning a ministry to immigrants. So we help churches with coaching. It's really just finding out what kind of resources does a church have? Who are the immigrants in their neighborhood? What have they done already? What has worked? What has has success looked like? 
and then thinking, okay, what can we do to start a class? So we do training seminars to help uh, churches get started. We sometimes help them with curriculum. And then we help churches think through, okay, what kind of curriculum do we need to use? How can we advertise? How do we recruit volunteers? And then churches will start and then inevitably churches will start a class and there'll be two students and five volunteers. And many will feel disappointed or discouraged with that. They think, no, that's really normal to yeah, start. At that's that how we started. We had two students and five volunteers. Yeah. yeah. So we can help troubleshoot. Is there another way we could advertise? Is there something else we could do to make this go forward? Now you're saying we, where can they find you? We have our website, lovenewcanadians.ca. It's a great place to see our the curriculum. We've written 16 books of curriculum that we use, that we've used in our context. We let churches buy that to use it in their own situation. So in our in our ministry at our church, we love using material that has been published other places. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And lots of our classes, we purchase material from publishers to use in our classes. But the books that we've written are the ones that finesse the pathway and that have the right gentle approach that we want for some of our specific classes. So, And we're happy to share that stuff with other churches. Well, thank you for your generosity there. We'll make sure that those links to your website are in the show notes. Now, I'd also like to mention a one-page summary that Rick and Patty have prepared, uh, which summarizes this intercultural ministries approach. It has a summary of each of the three stages that we've talked about, settlement classes, bridges classes, and spiritual classes, and it will be available on the podcast website as well. Of course, you can find it on their website also. Lots of great resources. As we wind down here, Rick and Patty, I know we can only touch the tops of these mountains, but it's been very helpful. I'd like to ask this last question. If you have the opportunity to stand in front of a missions committee and the pastor, and there's a group of them even, or maybe they're on Zoom. We need to imagine that these days. If you had a chance to address this group of leaders, what would you like to say to them? Well, we know that churches are looking for ways to introduce Jesus to people who do not yet know him throughout the world, as well as in our own neighborhoods. So we encourage churches to, at least long term, consider developing a pathway to Jesus for immigrants using the three stages that we've discussed today. So the the settlement, the bridges, and then the, the spiritual classes. But the thing is, if if you're starting from zero, that can be really overwhelming. It's like, we have zero classes. How are we supposed to have three? So we encourage churches just to start with one class. Make it a simple class, a stage one class, say like conversation class, where all you need is friendly people who can speak English, who can listen, and just share their love and kindness with people who come. And start that class, the conversation class, and then... Maybe after a month or two or three, think, hey, is there a party we could do? Because parties are a great way to meet the families of those who are coming to our classes and for them to meet our families. And then as that class is maturing, developing, maybe six months, 12 months later, when, the, when that class is going really well, then consider starting a stage two class, the Bridges class. Well, that's a good word because you've, you've shared, of course, uh, a very mature system. You've worked on this for a long time. You've put a lot of energy into it. You do come from a very substantial church and a big community. I think it's a good word to say that this is accessible to any church at that appropriate level, right? Absolutely. We've worked with churches as small as 25 members up to extremely large churches. <laughs> Well, this has been very helpful again. I'll mention, it'll be in the show notes, but episode four is an, another angle on this ministry five years ago, and now it's just uh, continued to develop. The Lord has blessed it. Rick and Patty, it's really clear that you have a passion to help the churches and to help others. Thank you for that. And thanks for joining us to share of that again today on the Global Missions Podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. It's been great to be here. Well, as we sign off today, let me tell you about a couple of other episodes related to this topic. Number five is entitled Relationship Building in Your Neighborhood with Titch Trong. 
And 116 was entitled Reaching International Students, a Strategic Opportunity with Yao Purby. That is an energetic interview, I remember. You can also search through our entire library with a search engine on the website about how to reach out to Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, and Hindu neighbors. Today, we want to add a shout out to Quina, who is a member of our advisory group on behalf of InterSurf Canada. Thanks, Quina, for being part of shaping this program as we seek to collaborate in God's work. This episode is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox and produced by Send International in collaboration with other like-minded agencies like InterSurf Canada. Thanks for taking a moment to subscribe and for leaving us a review. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Join us again in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.